Now then, June. I'm sorry I haven't been for a bit, but, well, I've been finishing off another batch of them face masks. I got some lovely material in Boise's. And our Sarah said, if I can get them over to her, then she'll photograph them and put them on her Etsy. The other ones all went in a few days. She thinks I should have put them on for more than five, but, well, I don't want to be greedy. And anyway, I've quite enjoyed doing it, to be honest. It's kept me occupied. <laughs> I offered one to little Jill, but she said she prefers the printed ones you get on the market. The hideous. Well, that's her look out. She had one on at Carol's birthday barbecue. Well, we couldn't believe it. Steve asked her why she chose that particular one and she said, oh, I like the shade of lipstick and it makes me look surprised. Now, half a surprise is when he told her it was the mouth of a blow-up doll. She hadn't a clue. <laughs> oh, she's funny, Steve. Dry. I've always sort of fancied him, to be honest, but never let on. Not even after Jenny died. Seemed disrespectful. Silly, really. <laughs> I don't know what's happening with our Mark on that front. I haven't heard from him since me and little Jill saw him at Gino de Campos on that date. I told her we should go eat somewhere else, but she wouldn't. She had a voucher and it had to be used on that date. Anyway, we got a table at the other side of the restaurant and hoped he wouldn't notice us. Jill said, just ignore him. But I couldn't stop watching him. They both seemed very drunk. And I think she was quite bored. She kept checking her phone and looking about the place. And then our Mark, he starts doing this magic trick or something with a candle. Well, until the waiter came over and told him to stop. He was on his own after that. Jill said she heard somebody being sick in the ladies, but I think she might have gone. Anyway, we paid the bill and tried to sneak out. But he noticed us. Said I was spying on him. Jill said, don't you speak to your mother like that. And he told her to mind her own business. Well, fuck off Miss Marple with his actual words. I know it's none of my business. But he don't want to leave it much longer. Time's getting on. I know forty's not old, old, but it is if you're not settled. It's never too late, and it's a damn sight harder if you're a yellow leaf. I told him I'd put some dye on his hair. He had it cut a few weeks back, and there was quite a lot of grey actually. But he said it don't bother me, mother and I don't want to end up looking like a fucking aubergine. I said, no, it'll be subtle. You'll hardly notice it. Won't make you look stupid, Mark. Oh, I did like Helen. She was kind and lovely. I really thought she might be the one. She did try, but petered out. She just drifted away like the rest. You can't hang on forever, can you? I often wonder, June, the way he is, if it's because of me and Peter. You know, seeing what went on between the two of us when he was growing up. But you try and hide all that stuff from the kids, the rows and the... I think they pick up on a lot more than you realise. They were loved, oh by God they were, but well, we weren't like you and Ray. And if they don't see it between the parents, I think it might leave a gap when they're adults and start to form relationships. I don't know. Is it like breathing? You're born knowing how to love or like language, you've got to hear it and see it before you can do it yourself. 
I did see an awful lot they shouldn't have when they were growing up and I were in such a state back then, plotted most of it out. But that night though, I never told you about it. I never talked to anyone about it. Peter left December, but I still used to drive about late looking for his car. It were about midnight. Thick snow. Kids are in the back shivering. Mark's in his pyjamas and our Sarah, she's in this, this little mouse outfit my mother bought her for Christmas. Said she'd only come if I let her wear it. <laughs> Just turned seven. I should have been asleep in bed. I just couldn't settle until I found it, knew where he was. Poor little buggers. Roads were that slippery, I should never have been out in that car. He were parked right in front of her house, Red Cavalier. Well, we'd seen it, that were that. We could turn round and go back to Wessel. But just then, a whole light comes on and they're at the front door. You can see the shapes through the glass and he's kissing her, about to leave. Sarah starts crying, panicking. Mark's begging me to go. I feel dreadful about it now, but, but just in that moment I thought, right, if I can just hang on for a second or two, just long enough for him to see, for them both to see what they're doing to these beings, to me. They come out and they see us. I go to pull away, but the engine stalls. I turn the ignition, it won't start. That bloody green mini. I try again, nothing. And by the third or fourth time, we'll have had the chalk pulled out and I can hear the battery draining. One last time, nothing dead. By now, Sarah's screaming. Mark's wet himself and we're just sat there, stuck. Shit, I think, what we're going to do now? Her and Peter stood on the step just staring at us for what seemed like an eternity until finally she tells him he's got to go and help us. He walks towards the car. He's got that face on. I know what it meant. He's humiliated, but I know he won't hit me in front of her. Kids didn't know that though. I wind the window down and I just lose it. You slag, I'm going, you fucking this and that. I'm calling her all the names under the sun. Kids are screaming at Peter and he's shouting, put it in neutral and put it in fucking neutral. He's trying to give us a push start, but I can't hear anything above the chaos. And I can still see her vividly. She's standing at the gate with her arms crossed, just staring at us. Nothing on her face. No shock, shame, embarrassment, nothing. And before she turned to go inside, I remember thinking, I'll never forget this, June. She looked just like Myra Hindley did on those photos. Anyway, somehow he manages to get us going. I pop the clutch, start the engine and off we go. I look in the rearview mirror and Peter's flat on his face in the slush. That was the last time we saw him. He died that night. He had a heart attack right there in the road. And if I'd turned round and gone back down Nesel High Road like you normally would, we'd have seen him. But I didn't. I turned off and went past Picky Park instead. And I'm glad. I'm glad kids didn't see him like that. I'm glad we were rid of him forever and she couldn't have him either. It's a terrible thing to think, June, but I did. 
and I still do. Don't know what it did to the kids though. Sarah and her Chris seem to be doing all right, but I do wonder about Mark. Must have had some bearing on him, wasn't it? Just don't want him to be lonely. Making up in that flat one morning and there'd be no one there. And it's all too late. They do say there's someone for everyone, but that's a load of shite, isn't it? Right, well, I'd best be making tracks. Eric's coming round to do the edge. He's bringing his drill and some wood to make a placard. There's a protest march on in town on Saturday for that poor woman who died in that fire down Ruskin Street. She were murdered. I don't listen to the news usually, but... Well, I heard a name and my ears pricked up. I only came in at the end, but it said she worked in a care home. So I put it in the Google and you'll never guess who it was. You know, my mother was in the Willows and there was that lovely carer, the black one everybody liked. It was her, Mercy. Do you remember she used to knit them them woolly hats? so they could sit out of an evening in that bit at the back and have a cig and a natter. Oh, it's dreadful. She'd been having all sorts shoved through a letterbox for months leading up to it. And then this one night, somebody posted a firework. Well, the curtains caught and the old flat went up. She were trapped. It seems the doors in the flats were illegal and should never have been fitted. They expanded in the heat and she couldn't get out. Bastards. Can you imagine what she must have gone through? I mean, you hear about these things, but, well, you feel so helpless, and I just tend to tune it out. But you know, when it's someone you know, well, it shouldn't make any odds, but, anyway, I saw a poster in the village about this march. It seems that the police knew what was happening, but just ignored it. And the council, well, they'd been warned about them flats, but didn't do anything. It's dreadful. I mean, I've never done anything like this before, and I don't know if it'll make a blind bit of difference. But I can't do nothing. You can't treat people this way, June. She was a human being. I don't know what goes on at these things. I mean, do you shout and chant? I shan't be doing any of that. I don't want to get tear gassed. But I do want to go and show my support. Might see if our Mark will come with us. Right. Well, I promised you I won't let you get into a state and I meant it. There shall be fresh flowers every two weeks and I'll make sure your stone don't go green. Oh, Eric said he'll keep an eye on you on his way to his allotment. He asked if you'd like a little nightlight installed. I said, well, I don't think she's going to be getting up to go to the fridge for a snack, but thank you. <laughs> oh, your Katie has got your pine dresser in a new kitchen. I made sure she got it. Didn't let them greedy buggers get their hands on it. She's put some willow pattern on the shelves. It looks beautiful. You were right about that. It really suits it. I'll see you, Nan. To our love. Miss you.